Hi, everyone. So I'm back for our last installment on Asian American studies, or Asian Americans in the United States within the subfield of Asian American studies. Um, and so today we're going to think about a couple of different things, one being the kind of rise of anti-Asian um, hate crimes and racism. We talked a little bit about this with Vincent Chin, and obviously it's connected history with um, uh, the Korean and Vietnam Wars, um, Japanese internment and uh, bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the Filipino uh, or the Philippines problem, right? The Spanish, uh, I'm sorry, the U.S. colonization of the island and the Philippine American War, and then obviously this connects all the way back to the Chinese Exclusion Act. Whew, that's a lot, right? So all of that now coming to the head with COVID, with so much extra stuff, right? So again, we want to talk about COVID not as this kind of epiphenomenon, right? Not something that's new, but rather kind of this long standing history of US, of whites, of political stakeholders in the West, essentially blaming immigrants and non-white people, i.e. people of color for problems that we have, right? Like no matter what, COVID is bad, but the United States' response to COVID is what got us in the situation that we're in today. And if uh, Trump would have done what he needed to do earlier on, would have had a completely different scenario. And we've seen this actually been, be much more effective in other countries uh, in the West, right? But here we're not seeing as effectively and, and now President Biden is kind of dealing with the fallout of that. So, uh, and then obviously the, the rise in anti-Asian hate crime is should be like front and center in terms of like our alarm bells in terms of the enduring legacy of racism still affecting communities of color. So as we have police violence going on, as we have people incarcerated and detained, as we have COVID cases being rampant in Native American communities, we also have, guess what, rising anti-Asian hate crime, right? And so all of these things, again, are showing that we are not done with racism in the United States. It is still front and center, folks. Big, big time. So let's get through this material. Let's talk about this and understand that we're not done, that we still got a lot of problems in this country. And what you're going to get to do with your final is think about all this stuff, right, and create a cool project that's going to show the world what you've learned and why we should care about the issues that we've covered in this class. So with that, let's get into it. Uh, so uh, I wanna get into a couple different paradigms today. Uh, one being the model minority myth, which you may or may not have heard about, and the idea of ra racial triangulation. There is gonna be a few more key concepts. We've, we've gone down a little bit in terms of our key terms but we are going to talk about a few more today, so just bear with me on that. Uh, the article that you read for this is by UN on uh, real inequality. Now, um, part of my desire for having you read that is to think about media construction, and then I, I will elaborate more in detail in this lecture how this pertains to uh, other issues. But I think it's important to think about media in terms of this because a lot of the reasons why we're here is because politicians and media, remember, the social and the political are always helping to make race, right? Media is creating the ideas about race, politicians are running on that, and then they're passing laws to legally codify it, right? So that's who we are, right? So first, we're going to think about who are Asian Americans, right? It's a big subgroup, lots of different people, so we want to get into that reality. We're going to talk about enduring anti-Asian racism, particularly in the, in the 21st century and in the 2020s, right? Or in the 2010s and 2020, right? Uh, Anti-Asian discrimination and violence, AAPI issues. And we are going to start to shift away from the Asian American paradigm to also include Pacific Islanders and Desi or Hindu communities. Um, and this invisibility with the model minority myth, we will break down the model minority myth, and then that will help us understand racial triangulation. We have four key terms for today. One is whitewashing and tight, and the other one is typecasting. I'm going to talk about those two connectedly because they have to do with media. Um, but in short, what media tends to do is whitewash a character, i.e. give a role that is designate, designated for a person of color to a white individual, say, claiming that it is much more marketable, right? Or it will make the movie much more effective. If we we'll remember back to the TED Talk by America Ferreira, in our Latino um, contemporary social issues uh, lecture, she talks a lot about that, right? That she wouldn't get cast because, you know, they didn't want to cast the role diversely or they already had a Latina or they needed to cast the white role or it wasn't marketable, so on and so forth. So whitewashing is a real thing and it does happen. 
Conversely, right, with that, we also see typecasting. And so typecasting is the idea that we will have, um, uh, you know, roles that are created that are stereotypical um, and basically pigeonhole a person of color into playing something that minimizes or reduces their experiences. And, and I actually, in effect, it's done almost explicitly for the entertainment of white audiences and creates a lot of hostility and antagonism in the community of color that that actor or actress is representative of um, because they feel that that individual who's portraying that role or playing that character is, is essentially being a traitor. So it's very, very harmful. Secondly, we're gonna talk about, and we're actually ter tertiarily, we're gonna talk about the model minority myth and the construction of Asian Americans is this kind of monolithic community that has all of these great attributes um, and is hyper successful, although that's not actually the case. Uh, um, and especially when we look at the data and then finally, this idea of racial triangulation, I'm sorry, where we can start to see what Asian Americans social standing actually means, um, because they're actually in this very liminal or in between state, right? They're somewhat accepted, somewhat not. They've been giving some kind of um, acceptance. But what COVID has shown us, and I want to be very clear about this, is that we live in a time where uh, we don't actually have full acceptance of Asian Americans, right? We're not in a post-race society because Asians are quote unquote making it. And actually there's a lot of anti-Asian racism going on. Um, there is a degree to which some people within this community are doing well. However, like with all communities, there are always some folks who do well, but that does not mean that we're done with racism. That just means that in a large system of uh, a complex racist or racially discriminatory um, environment, of course, there are going to be outliers, right? There are gonna be some folks who support racism, right? You're gonna have Latinos, African-Americans, Asian-Americans, Native Americans who, who are Trump supporters. And then you're gonna have some folks that are successful, right? There are tons of, or there are, you know, a select few of the, you know, elites from each of those communities that have quote unquote made it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that is a moniker or a benchmark that we've actually made it to being much more successful. It just means that these folks are just outliers in the larger uh, nebula of our racist society. So who are these folks, right? So Asian Americans or AAPIN Desi, meaning Asian, Asian Americans, right? Pacific Islanders and Desi, which uh, refers to the Hindu regions or the Hindu speaking areas of the subcontinent of India encompass the second largest ethnically diverse community, right? So when we think about AAPIs, we have to encompass all of South and Southeast and East Asia, right? So that's a huge territorial landmass, including all of those islands, right? Which make up the Pacific Islands. And then obviously um, all of the different cultures, languages within that, right? So um, uh, this group of people is very culturally diverse and has very different economic realities, okay? So we do not want to say that just because you are Asian American, you are successful. That has been the failing of crazy rich Asians. There's been this promulgation that there, that all Asians are successful and that is not unnecessarily the case, right? Like with Chicanx and Latinx communities, this group is often understood with a monolithic framework, meaning that we collapse all Asian Americans or all Asians into one experience, okay? Filipinos do not experience the same things that Asians do or that Chinese folks do. Japanese folks don't feel the same thing that Taiwanese folks do, uh, so on and so forth, right? So we wanna be very clear that they are very diverse, right? They're gonna be, uh, API communities are projected to be the largest immigrant community in the United States. They're going to outpace um, Latinos in the United States, but brown folks as it is are gonna be the third, second largest um, demographic fairly soon. And that's largely because there's a huge amount of people here that are having children and growing. So it will be whites, um, Latinos, and then Asians essentially. Uh, Many of these folks are undocumented and that's been a big part of a lack of focus on undocumented um, or immigration policy is not trying to support that specific group. Um, folks speak English, folks don't. Some folks speak, uh, practice Western um, uh, religion, some don't, right? So they're you know, actually very assimilated in many ways. Uh, and poverty rates vary across communities, right? So there are some 
that are very economically stable and successful, and there are some that are not, right? And we think about the area in which um, LBCC serves, um, there's a large um, uh, Pacific Islander community that has struggled historically with poverty, um, and many folks from Southeast Asia as well, Cambodia and Laos that live in the region that have um, faced that same kind of marginalization. And so we don't, again, want to treat um, all Asian communities with this sense of um, exception that they just do well. Rather, we want to be very clear that the complexities of race and racism impact these communities differently. And as we've seen in the previous lecture, each of some of the more historically large communities, Filipinos, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, so on and so forth, have um, had different kinds of struggles, um, but they're still related to the overarching system of racism that um, affects the United States, right? So what are provided here for you here on the right are some stats, right? So we can see, um, you know, the projected growth of Asian immigrant communities and look at the point in which most immigration happens, right? In the 1980s on up. And again, fallout from all of those wars and we see this exponential growth in terms of um, Asian American immigration, right? Uh, you know, we see them so, um, surpassing Hispanics in terms of uh, immigrants here, uh, you know, doing well economically varies, right, where you have um, high poverty rates for Mongolian and other populations, and then um, some uh, communities like Indian Americans have lower uh, poverty rates. But realistically, Asian American poverty rates is not that distinct. It's only three percentage points above the overall U.S. population. So they're still pretty low or still, uh, still have significantly high um, poverty rates, right? Uh, we see that most of them, again, are speaking English, and then all of these folks having very large um, undocumented populations, right? So India, China, Philippines, all of these communities, again, uh, historical relationship with us having um, large uh, undocumented uh, groups here in the United States. So, um, again, as we've seen, um, these communities face uh, generations of racial discrimination and racism. Again, whether we're thinking about discriminatory laws, internment camps, um, or mob violence and lynchings and ethnic enclaves, right? There's always these pieces, right? One of the biggest mass lynchings happened in a Chinatown, right? Um, this is the second largest mass lynching next to the Dakota one. So Native, so Native Americans, Asian Americans, Latinos, African Americans, all facing that type of racial violence, right? Uh, and this community now facing even more uh, violence due to the misassociation and the false blaming of Chinese folks uh, for COVID. And what I want to really be clear on, and, and some of the examples you're going to see next are of other Asians that are not Chinese being targeted for a constructed social problem that is blamed on Asian communities rather than looking at the failing of the government to do what it needed to do or how the system itself created the conditions for these types of situations, right? And we saw this with 9-11. Although the terrorist attacks were heinous, there was a large concerted effort by um, pol politicians, media, all of those folks to essentially blame all Arab looking folks for 9-11 um, and that led to a rise in anti-Arab um, or Arab uh, Islamophobic uh, violence and, and um, uh, uh, Islamophobic uh, harassment and violence, right? And we're seeing this again with COVID-19, right? So I'll let this uh, video explain this a bit more. I shouted for help, but uh, nobody helped me. So I put my hands on my face. I saw the blood oozing. Asian and Pacific Islander Americans are facing a surge of attacks in the U.S. The rise in violence has sparked fear within the AAPI community. We went to New York City, where police data shows there has been a 1,900% increase in hate crimes against Asians. You need to be an Asian piece of shit. Racism against Asian Americans isn't new. So what is causing the rise of attacks? Do we know if all of these attacks are racially motivated? We do not know that, but look, they are unprovoked. Rallies have been held across the country to highlight the urgency of the issue. This is a story of how Asian Americans are finding solidarity in one another despite a wave of attacks. So, you know, they've seen me. 
很不高兴，我一想到他们，我的心就放下一点。We will be invisible no more. We will speak up. We say that we are American too. You're looking at the face of a Filipino American man who was slashed while standing on a train to work. That was、uh, Wednesday, February third, and、uh, about eight o'clock, I was at the、uh, the L train. I stood there quietly. A man came, and I stood beside me. He started kicking my、uh, my bag. He came towards me. I thought he's going to punch me. But when I didn't feel anything, I saw his hand with a、uh, with a boxer、uh, cutter. I shouted for help, but、uh, nobody helped me. Noel is still unsure what motivated the attack. The police have not called it a hate crime. I don't know if it is because of the pandemic. I really don't know if it's because I'm Asian. I have no idea. So well, I am good, but but、um, it's not just like me. If it's just me, it's okay. But I also live with other people. No. Noel considers himself lucky. He's mourning for the victims who have not survived. Like this 84-year-old Thai man who died two days after an attack on his regular morning walk. Since the outbreak of COVID-19 in 2020, more than 2,800 self-reported accounts of violent and non-violent anti-Asian hate were recorded by a rights group. It's widely believed the spike in racist attacks is due to Donald Trump's rhetoric on coronavirus. But the reality is more complicated than that. It's difficult to pinpoint one root cause for the surge in attacks, but some say a combination of the rhetoric blaming Asians, particularly during the pandemic, along with the ease of recording and sharing these attacks, has contributed to making the issue more visible. We spoke to Representative Judy Chu, who says racism against Asians in the U.S. goes far beyond Trump's presidency. Of course, we have a very long history in this country, going all the way back to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. It was the first legislation to bar immigration of an ethnic group. Yet, Asian Americans have played an indispensable role in building the country. The Chinese Americans、uh, were responsible. For the transcontinental railroad from the West Coast to Utah, but now we see that Asian Americans of all backgrounds are essential workers. They are the ones that are on the front lines of the COVID-19 response to combat the recent crimes. New York City created an Asian hate crime task force, but many say more policing is not the answer. This is how a younger generation of Asian Americans are responding to their elderly who are in fear. Dozens of Asian restaurants and volunteers come together every Wednesday to gather thousands of food packages. It actually started because we, my girlfriend and I, were experiencing racism firsthand. People saying very nasty, profane language, telling us to go back to where we're from. At the same time, we were hearing about food insecurity and our elderly also being violently attacked. The same time last year. Despite the stereotype that Asian Americans are flourishing economically, Asians are experiencing record unemployment and hunger. In New York City, almost one out of four Asians were unemployed in 2020. And businesses in Chinatown have been suffering. So we decided to counter all of that negativity and hatred with love. And how do we express love in the Asian culture? Many times it's through food. Mrs. and Mr. Lee say they only go out once a month because they're scared. To them, these bags mean much more than a hearty meal. <laughs> 很不高兴，我一想到他们，我的心就放下一点。你对他们志愿者要说什么？有什么心情吗？他呢，每次来做我的心理辅导，辅导我有什么事情。
So what can the government do to protect those like Mr. and Mrs. Lee? President Biden signed a memorandum condemning anti-Asian hate, but Asian lawmakers say there is more to be done. We immediately asked for a meeting with the Department of Justice. We want to talk to look for ways to better prosecute such crimes. In addition, we are pushing the... Well, we'll move on. So um, as you know, events in the film, there has been a rise in anti-Asian hate, hate crimes. We see this here. Uh, you know, uh, verbal harassment, shunning, physical assault, right? Coughed and spat on. All of these are huge. Um, a record 2,100 in, uh, incidents of hate uh, going on, right? Uh, and we see lots of more discrimination. Um, Asian American women facing this a lot um, across most of the um, uh, sub ethnic categories, right? Whether they're East Asian, Southeast Asian, South Asian, multi ethnic, so on and so forth. And we even want to harken back to President Trump, like evincing Islamophobic uh, rhetoric, right? And although I understand that the Middle East doesn't often get talked about in the same uh, tone or talked about in the same sentence as Asian Americans, remember that much of the Middle East is still a part of Asia, right? It's not Europe and it's not necessarily Africa. And so when you have uh, President Trump or former President Trump, I'm sorry, or Trump, saying that, you know, Islam hates us, that it's the Kung flu, that China's to blame, right? We see these increases, right? Hate crimes, attacks on mosques, right? It's 67% increase in hate crimes against Muslims since 2016, right? So huge in terms of its material effects, right? And so again, law or media creating these notions about race, right? Uh, politicians running on these frameworks of Islamophobia, of anti-Asian uh, xenophobia, racism, so on and so forth, passing laws, passing policies, supporting individuals, now materializing into these direct and harmful effects against you know, com our, our communities, right? Our communities, BIPOC communities, right? Um, and so misrepresenting Asians has been a big part of the problem, right? And so I, that's again why I had you read the article for today. So um, APIs have been misrepresented in, in media in two important ways, again, whitewashing. So uh, what we see with whitewashing, and I'll show a video about this in a second, is we see whites taking the roles of Asian Americans, which is evinced by these three examples here. I only use three, but there are many, many more, right? Older Asian man uh, played by Tilda Swinton, right? Um, the very problematic and historically harmful representation of Apu and the Simpsons played by a white man, right, was uh, um, Scarlett Johansson taking over as the main character of a very historically popular manga and uh, anime cartoon, right, and so in all of these cases, right, either eight white folks taking that role, right, uh, erasing Asians from the role itself, or them playing a very stereotypical role, this idea of like black, yellow, red, and brown face, and we've seen this in other instances and in other kind of parodies in the past where whites um, take it upon themselves to play us in these very horrific ways. And then, you know, it has these very harmful effects on individuals, right? We think about the black white doll experiment with kids replicated in 2019, where, you know, all of the dolls of color essentially are trampled on and beaten uh, and kind of thrown away, essentially, where white dolls are not treated in the same way. Um, with that, we see typecasting happening too. Right, and again, that's the problematic representation or the problematic casting of, of um, people of color within these very stereotypical roles. And again, we're still dealing with this. We have seen much greater storytelling in the past um, with more meaningful representation, but we're still not really seeing enough of our stories being told. So before I get too much further into this, let me show this uh, clip on um, Yellowface in Hollywood. When someone like Scarlett Johansson is cast as the lead in an adaptation of a Japanese comic franchise, it's important to understand that the ensuing anger isn't just about that movie. And it's not just about Tilda Swinton playing a Tibetan character in Marvel's Doctor Strange, or Emma Stone claiming to be part Chinese and Hawaiian in Aloha. My dad was half Chinese and half Hawaiian, and my mother's Swedish. It's how all these casting decisions combined, dating back to the earliest days of Hollywood, have made Asians invisible at best, and at worst, the butt of a cruel joke. 
That's why fans notice when the characters from the last Airbender cartoon become much lighter skinned for the live action movie. And when John Rico goes from being Filipino in the novel Starship Troopers to being played by someone named Casper Van Dien. I wanna try it again, but this time we need you to do an accent. The fact is things aren't getting better fast enough for Asians in Hollywood. In 1944, Aline McMahon was nominated for an Oscar for her yellow face role in Dragon Seed. Later on, Linda Hunt would win an Oscar for playing a Chinese man in The Year of Living Dangerously. Right, Billy Kwan. That was 1982, almost 40 years later. Basically everything else in the country had changed except white people being cast as Asians. For a solid two decades, the Chinese detective character Charlie Chan was played by white men in makeup. But that was the 30s and 40s, right? Well, here's Jim Sturgis and Hugo Weaving reincarnated as Koreans for parts of Cloud Atlas. Everyone remembers Mickey Rooney's infamous 1961 performance in Breakfast at Tiffany's as just fully unacceptable and racist, right? Well, 24 years later, Joel Gray delivered this Korean caricature in Remo Williams. I think I can do something with him. And another two decades later, here's Rob Schneider, and I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry. Now the links are a symbol of eternity. Schneider is a quarter Filipino, so progress? Okay. Or how about Peter Sellers' 1968 role as a clueless Indian man at a dinner party? Oh, you really crushed my own Indian <laughs> A full 20 years later, Fisher Stevens was in brown face for Short Circuit 2. It's not possible. We are the type of people who have everything. And another 24 years after that, Ashton Kutcher is doing this in a Pop Chips commercial. I'm Raj. I'm a Bollywood producer. I'm looking for the most delicious thing on the planet. Arguably worse than white people playing Asian characters is white people playing real-life Asian humans, which is what happened to Cora Lijek in Argo, and to Jeffrey Ma, who appeared in the movie 21 as this character, even though in real life he was this guy. Ben Campbell was the most gifted student at MIT. It's not surprising that directors want to hire big names to attract producers and funding, but when they want to do stories about Asians and won't cast Asian actors, they should know that the blowback against that has been building for the better part of a century. Sakini by name, interpreter by profession. One of the early examples of a white cast playing Asian characters was The Good Earth in 1937, based on the hugely popular novel by Pearl S. Buck. There was an Asian actress who wanted the lead part. Her name was Anna Mae Wong, and she was basically the only Chinese American movie star at the time. One of the reasons that MGM reportedly snubbed her was that in the 30s and 40s, Hollywood was censored by a moral code, and it prohibited things like nudity and profanity, but also interracial romance. So once they cast a white man to play Wang Lung, they couldn't cast Wong to play his wife. The role went to a German-born actress named Louise Rayner, and she went on to win an Oscar for it. Again, right, we see problematic representations reinforcing these stereotypical ideas or just invisibilizing Asian communities. And if we go back, right, as we have a lack of absence of discussion or any concerted um, knowledge about what's going on in Asian communities, we have these instances happen, right? And so, this gives rise to this myth of the model minority, right? And I know that was talked about in the very first video, and I want to really double down on it here. But the model minority has been constructed to essentially position Asians as a kind of buffer against whiteness, or I'm sorry, a buffer against racism. Uh, we uh, Asian American success, which again is is limited because it depends on the sub ethnic group, and and there are a lot of folks. Myself, I'm Latino. Uh, I'm successful relative because now I'm a professor and I'm economically uh, well off or stable, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all Latinos are like me, right? There are a lot of folks that face challenges and I've made, faced many challenges to get here, right? Um, that reality is what we see born out here, right? So, um, you know, this kind of long legacy of anti-Asian racism, sentimism, sentiments, so on and so forth, right, um, all of these various barriers, the lack of representation and the construction of the model minority myth, right, um, masks these issues. And so essentially, you know, again, political media influencers say, hey, Asians are doing well, but there's a lack of robust analysis and critical engagement with those realities. 
and what we'll see in this next video, and I'm sorry for the so many videos, but they kind of emphasize these points a bit more, show what is this myth, how is it problematic, and how is it tied into this larger issue of missing the historical markers that have told us that Asian American racism uh, or ra racism against Asian Americans has been so prolific and been so rice and been so enmeshed in our society historically. And we're not talking about it enough because we just assume that Asians are making it. You probably know this stereotype. Asians are hardworking, super smart, and really good at math and science. And all those things seem good, right? It's so reductive because, you know, it, it's really stripping away the fact that you as an individual are talented or smart and saying, oh, it's because of your race. This idea of the intelligent, well-behaved Asian American is known as the model minority myth. But don't be fooled by the name. It's not a compliment. It's one of the most persistent Asian American stereotypes and comes with some really harmful consequences. To fully understand it, we have to look at its origins and how we went from this to this. Hey, I'm Anna, and this Sunday on AJ Plus, we're dissecting the model minority myth, showing its evolution and highlighting how harmful it is, not only for Asians, but for all communities of color. <laughs> Belinda tried to fit the mold for years. I would say the model minority myth affected my relationship with myself and kind of clouding my vision of um, who I was as a person. And Belinda's not alone in experiencing this. To learn more about the model minority myth, we spoke to Frank Wu, a professor in Asian American studies. The model minority myth is dangerous because it's a racial stereotype. It's a story, a script that even though a little part of it is true, once we accept this racial generalization, it goes all sorts of places that we can't control. You know, this model minority concept didn't always exist. When Chinese immigrants first showed up in the US in the 1800s, white America saw them as heathens who stole their jobs and raped their women. This was known then as the yellow peril. The xenophobia and discrimination escalated, leading Congress to pass the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, which completely banned Chinese immigration to the U.S. Sounds kind of familiar, huh? The notion that if you're Asian, you can never become American. You can't be a full member of this society. And it didn't end there. As Asian immigration grew throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, they continued to face discrimination. There were violent mobs during the 1930s against Filipinos in Northern California. And of course, there was the Japanese internment during World War II. This scapegoating of various Asian communities went on until about the 1960s. And then in 1966, the New York Times published a piece by Professor William Peterson titled Success Story, Japanese American Style. This article is considered one of the most influential stories ever written on Asian Americans and effectively gave birth to the term model minority. It said, barely more than 20 years after the end of the wartime camps, this is a minority that has risen above even prejudiced criticism. By any criterion of good citizenship, the Japanese Americans are better than any other group in our society, including native born whites. At first, the term only applied to Japanese Americans. Then it quickly grew to include all East Asians. Then eventually, anyone who even looks slightly Asian. What is said of Chinese is extended to Japanese. What's said of Japanese is transferred to Koreans and so on and so on and so on. That's why the model minority myth has just expanded because people really can't tell the difference. They can't be bothered. And the success was partially true, at least in the realm of education. By the mid 1900s, Asian Americans on average had higher levels of education than African Americans. But that wasn't the whole story. In 1965, the Immigration Act reversed years of restrictive immigration policies that virtually banned all immigration from Asia, but it allowed only those with certain backgrounds to enter the US, namely professionals like doctors and engineers. It was a brain drain. And right as the civil rights movement was gaining steam, the model minority stereotype 
started to gain traction. From the very beginning, the model minority myth has been false flattery. It's not even really about people of Asian descent. It's a way to insult African-Americans, Hispanics, and others. But despite this stereotype of Asians as submissive and keeping their heads down, Asians have a long and storied history of civil disobedience in this country, which is often overlooked by the media. The media also plays a role in perpetuating stereotypes about Asians. In 2014, former Fox News host Bill O'Reilly sparked a controversy when he asked, Do we have Asian privilege in America? Because the truth is that Asian American households earn far more money than anyone else. He cited Asian academics in median household incomes as being better than those of whites. Probably unsurprising coming from a man who doesn't believe in white privilege. And a conservative political commentator, Andrew Sullivan, ignited a debate around the model minority myth when he wrote, quote, Asian Americans, like Jews, are indeed a problem for the social justice brigade. How have bigoted white people allowed these minorities to do so well, even to the point of earning more on average than whites? The model minority myth has always been used as propaganda, as a way to say, yes, we applaud the Asians, but really what we're doing is denigrating other racial minorities by saying, if Asians can do this, it means there's no racial discrimination, disparities don't count. Sullivan's piece was seen as a thinly veiled attack on African Americans while not mentioning them at all or the systemic injustices they've consistently faced even after the civil rights era. But here's the problem. The truth is lost in the numbers. For example, if you compare the net worth of Chinese or Japanese Americans to Korean Americans, you see a stark difference. Meanwhile, one fifth of Vietnamese Americans don't have a high school diploma and often end up in low paying service jobs. And almost 40% of the Hmong community have less than a high school degree, about 25 percentage points lower than both the Asian American and US averages. Asian American leaders have lobbied for a breakdown of the government statistics so that each of these communities' educational, housing, and language needs can be met. But there's another issue around Asians that few are talking about, the undocumented. One out of every seven Asian immigrants is undocumented. That's 1.7 million people. That's about the size of Dallas, Texas. Many undocumented Asian immigrants would qualify for DACA or the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program introduced under President Obama. So why aren't more undocumented Asians coming forward? They're kind of reluctant to seek help. They internalize the struggles they go through because they're expected to put on this um, outward appearance of, of being stable and being successful. The stereotype of the model minority becomes internalized for many Asians in the U.S. And there are some pretty devastating consequences. As a child, I remember having obsessive compulsive disorder and kind of using um, different like rituals, um, compulsions and um, you know what uh, symptoms of that to kind of feel a sense of control in my own life in a world where I felt like I lacked control. Asian Americans are also less likely to seek help for their emotional or mental health problems than white Americans. And US born Asian women, even more so. They have a higher lifetime rate of suicidal thoughts than the general US population. That's almost 16% of Asian American women as compared to 13 and a half percent of the general population. The suicide death rates are 30% higher for Asian American girls and women between 15 and 24 than they are for their white peers. Looking back, I didn't really realize that throughout my junior high and high school years, I was pretty severely depressed. Um, you know, since I've been medicated since, and I think that there should be absolutely no shame or stigma involved with mental health. And despite the fact that some Asian groups have higher levels of wealth and education and are represented in higher numbers than other minority groups in fields like tech and medicine, it doesn't mean that things are necessarily better. Asian Americans are still heavily underrepresented in business, media, sports, and government, a phenomenon described as the bamboo ceiling. For example, only 3% of the total board seats in Fortune 500 companies in the US are Asian or Pacific Islander, and top level positions in business are still overwhelmingly filled by white people. And for all that higher education, Asians realize lower returns than white people. This means Asians need more years of schooling to earn the same amount of money as their white counterparts. And perhaps the most glaringly underrepresented field is one we all look at every single day, media. Can you remember the last time an Asian actor played a romantic lead in a major motion picture? Or a lead at all for that matter? Asian actors regularly struggle to get starring roles in movies or TV shows, even when the characters that are being cast are Asian. The fear of Asians has always been 
takeover invasion that Asians will overwhelm California on the West Coast. So one way to deal with that in the images that we see on television movies is to take situations where you would have Asian American characters and make them white. So not only is Hollywood not casting Asians in big movies or TV shows, but they're erasing Asian narratives and perspectives. Think Ghosts in the Shell and ScarJo or Emma Stone in Aloha, where white actresses played characters originally written as Asian. Shout out to Ed Screen. In business terms, this probably isn't the best idea since studies show that casting diverse leads in films and movies is more lucrative for studios and producers. The idea that Asians can endure everything they've been through and still be wildly successful means racial discrimination in this country doesn't exist, a notion that harms everyone. By framing Asians as the ideal community of color, the implication is that other communities of color are inherently less than. It erases Asian stories and the issues harming our communities. So how do we make sure that pervasive stereotypes don't keep Asian voices from being heard? Let me know what you'd like me to cover next and if you wanna keep the conversation. Okay, so as the speaker mentioned, right, we have this deep dive and, and it really has a lot of these harmful effects, right? It masks and invisibilizes the struggles that folks face, huge suicide rates, huge issues of depression, mental health services, so on and so forth. We don't obviously have a complex narrative of the economic struggles that folks face. And as I mentioned earlier, we cannot treat this group as a monolith, rather that there is a lot of complexities in their economic realities. And guess what? The model minority myth, not construct, not created, not by, not designed or defined by this community, has been used by whites essentially to show that they are quote unquote better, even though that's kind of sketchy at best. And right, it's used as a ploy to denigrate other communities of color. And so, again, right, we see this evolution of racism. How this is now creating a new divide and conquer logic. And so we want to be very clear that we're not in a moment of real post-racialness and all communities are affected in nuanced and complicated ways, but still have a connected thread through them, right? Uh, so again, the model minority myth uh, is used to kind of um, elide or hide, right? This persistent discrimination against um, it, or in the United States and essentially indirectly blame black and brown communities for their own circumstances. Again, it, it is a stereotypical view that, um, you know, a immigrant group or members of such group are better than others, right? And it's most often applied to Asian Americans, although there are model minorities uh, within certain communities. Cubans were seen as a model minority for Mexican or for Latinx communities. Um, obviously, Chinese and Japanese at first were seen as the better Asians above others, right? And we've seen this over time. Uh, and again, uh, we want to be very clear that you know, it serves to perpetuate white supremacy, right? If we can hide racism, if we can say this isn't happening, uh, then, you know, we're, we're basically serving or, or hiding um, the notions of, um, uh, of, of racism and white supremacy in our society, right? So uh, I wanted to mention that there are three key issues with the myth, right? Uh, again, that AAPI groups are expected to fit the, mold, the myth no matter what. Uh, and this happens, this actually has a really harmful effect in two ways. And I think this is one thing we saw with, um, with uh, the other woman that spoke, Catherine Kai, uh, when we're thinking about um, if you are an individual who is not economically successful or not good at STEM, then essentially you're just seen as deficient, right? That your inability to fit the myth or fit the mold makes you an outlier and not essentially a true person within your community, right? So that's really harmful because that puts a false, um, that puts a false benchmark on you in terms of your fitment and you can be essentially denigrated for not fitting, right? And, and that causes a, a type of psychic trauma there, right? Again, this pits API, API groups against other groups, right? Why am I burdened with racism or Asian Americans are gonna say that there isn't racism in our society, which it's not really the case, right? They're being affected, their communities are being affected, our communities are being affected, um, and our relative success or relative lack of success should not be seen as individual failures, but rather um, symptoms of an unequal society, right? Um, and then again, right, this is masking all of this long history. I mean, what so much from the 1850s on up has shown that API communities have never been fully accepted by Americans, by whites, by American society. 
And so the longer that we perpetuate the myth, the longer that we're going to continue to mask all of these atrocities and nor are we going to take the meaningful steps that we need to, to fix the problem, right? So uh, the best way to really understand this in terms of um, how Asians have been constructed is within this, uh, this context of racial triangulation. Um, and so we now have a new kind of class caste structure by race and by economics. Um, it's kind of hard to see here. I, I try to, to make this a bit more visible in this, in this diagram, but essentially um, we have a ruling class in the United States that's mostly whites and has some honorary whites. And then we have what's called like a petite bourgeoisie or this kind of pseudo elite. Uh, and there are Asian Americans that are doing better than other groups uh, compared and that's putting them closer to whiteness, but they're still not fully accepted, right? So whites for the most part are just generally whites and then some ethnic whites that were not considered to be whites originally, right? Like Irish Americans and, and Jewish Americans. Um, underneath that is gonna be some more poor whites. And then obviously we're gonna see um, Asians within that, um, the community, right? Then we're gonna see Hispanics, some um, Native Americans, so on and so, or I'm sorry, Hispanic and other kind of immigrant groups being right underneath that. And then it's gonna be African Americans and Native Americans fundamentally at the bottom. But what I will say is that for the bottom three categories that these folks are much more enigmatic, right? There's not clear cut boundaries, but rather that essentially if you are not white anywhere in between this is gonna be some level of economic, social and political deprivation. Um, this uh, chart here you can see on the left is how they map racial triangulation. And it is essentially to understand superiority and inferiority within the nexus of foreignness and insider. And where we can see that part of the reason why Asian Americans are not seen at the same level of wise in terms of their social acceptance or their quote unquote superiority is that because they are still considered to be foreign. So African Americans are not necessarily foreign, but they're kind of made to be foreign because they're not white, right? Like with Hispanics and Latinos, even if we speak English, right? We're, we're not considered to be native and white, right? So those two things collapse, kind of make you at the top of the quote unquote period. Mid. And then everything else underneath that pushes you down, 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 down those rungs and never really allows you to kind of break through, right? No matter how much you uh, uh, acculturate, assimilate, even maybe um, inbreed or, or mixed breed, whatever that looks like, there's always gonna be this degree to which you're gonna face that barrier. Um, and so, as long in this case, right, you have some Asian ancestry, that kind of blood quantum that we talked about with Native Americans, you're not going to be fully accepted. In this last video, which I'm going to round out with for the lecture, is really going to show what this ra racial triangulation means and why it's going to continue or the way that our society structured it, re relying on this system of racial or sorry, this, this racial triangulationism, I guess, for lack of a better term, or the, or the systems of racism are going to always position um, uh, Asian Americans not fully within that. And we can understand their social political positionality and lack of full acceptance or discrimination within this kind of theory of racial triangulation. Hey everybody. In this video, we will be discussing what racial triangulation is, its effects, and how it can be used to explain the economic competition between Black and Asian minority groups in the United States. So what is racial triangulation? According to Claire Kim, racial triangulation theory proposes that Asian Americans are triangulated within the field of race relations based on their position relative to Blacks and whites on two different dimensions. This results in a racial position distinct from other groups. Specifically, the American public simultaneously praises Asians as a model minority and marginalizes them as the others. The model minority myth is the idea that Asian immigrants have a specific skill set that allows them to become more economically successful in America. I go over in my head the things that I have told my immigrants. I remember saying to them, well, I'm Alice. I'm And suddenly I realized that by sharing these uh, traits about me, I'd unintentionally portrayed myself not as a unique candidate, but rather as the walking embodiment of almost every Asian stereotype known to man. 
The model minority myth has been extremely detrimental as it plays into the Asian American stereotypes portraying Asian moms as tiger moms and children as academic geniuses who work harder than everybody else. The model minority myth is used to excuse the issue that African Americans suffer from racial and systematic oppression with the notion that if they can succeed, so can you. In the book, Bitter Fruit, Claire Kim discusses racial triangulation and the racial order. Kim writes that the racial order in terms of privilege goes as follows, whites, Asians, Latino, and Blacks. Though there are many compounding and intersecting factors for this order, Kim points to two of the most contributing factors, residential segregation and economic marginalization. Kim argues that residential segregation leads to political exclusion and in turn, economic marginalizations of Blacks. Asians are the only racial group who get to live in white communities, work in Black communities, and socially engage in Asian communities. The establishment of Asian Americans in wealthy and largely white neighborhoods unlock opportunities such as better school due to better district funding, tutoring or privatized school help, and better opportunities for extracurricular advancement, which ultimately can lead to a more competitive college application. Access to these resources allow Asian and white generations to operate with an advantage over some black and brown individuals who statistically are more likely to come from areas without the same amount of wealth. The higher levels of education amongst Asians and lower levels of education amongst Blacks is heavily a contributing factor to the economic disparity between Blacks and Asians. Over 70% of Asians have at least a college degree, allowing them to get a leg up in the professional realm and acquire more wealth. This allows Asians to buy houses in white neighborhoods and work and live alongside whites. Meanwhile, many Blacks often cannot afford to live in these areas due to financial restrictions and absence of privileges such as generational wealth. While Black people grapple with discriminatory practices from residential segregation, Koreans capitalize on this by establishing stores in these communities. However, Koreans view their stores in Black neighborhoods as temporary stepping stone on the way to something greater. Viewer discretion is advised. The next video contains strong language and mature content. Down. Let it be broke, motherfucker. Can you dig it? It's done. Look at those Korean motherfuckers across the street. I bet you they haven't been off the port a year before they open up their own place. That's right, man. It's been about a year. A motherfucking year off the motherfucking port, and they already got a business in our neighborhood, a good business, occupying a building that had been boarded up for well, longer than I care to remember. And I've been here a long time. And now for the life of me. You know, I can't figure this out. Either them Korean motherfuckers are geniuses, or you black asses are just plain dumb. Fuck you. It's got to be because we are black. Ain't no other wait, explanation. Wait, wait, wait. No, no, I know, man. You, you know, man, bro, I am ain't they always trying to hey, keep the black man to be about shit? Oh, oh. Motherfuckers holding shit down. Tired of hearing that old excuse. Tired of hearing that shit. You know, I, shit. Tell you, I swear, man, I will be one happy fool when we open our own business right here in our neighborhood. I swear to God, I will be the first in line to spend what little money I got. In Black Politics and Neoliberal Racial Order, Michael Dawson discusses how banks such as Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and SunTrust prey on minorities using a system that charges Black people higher interest rates. Based on the statistics listed on the screen, Blacks are denied loans at a staggering 53%, which is two times the rate of whites. In addition to this, prospective Black small business owners are 18% more likely to be denied loans than Asian Americans. As potential Black business owners struggle to secure fair loans or required resources from white establishments, Asians are permitted to obtain said resources. Reflecting back on the argument on the distinct ability that Asians have to live, work, and engage in separate communities, Asian business owners in Black communities often have no ties to the community they serve outside of their business. With this in mind, Asians solicit the Black dollar and invest it back into whites or in Asian communities in which they reside in. Consequently, Black communities lose money to Asian business owners that, in most other circumstances, would be recycled back into the same community where the dollar was spent. For example, a Black business owner has a higher likelihood of living and interacting in the same community that they profit from.
Due to the fact that Black people do not have the same social and economic freedoms as your white and Asian counterparts, these Black business owners are highly likely to stay in and invest in businesses and practices of the Black community where they work and reside. This continues the circulation of the Black dollar. Such and talk on a brief conversation of the model minority myth, it is important to remind you all that the myth is largely based on accurate statistics showing higher median incomes and educational attainment for Asian Americans over other racial and ethnic groups, including whites. So when the Asian American community is broken down into its respective ethnic groups, a drastically different picture emerges. The poverty rate among Nepalese Americans is 21% higher than the official poverty rate. Among Americans are 20% less likely to have a bachelor's degree or more than the average American. The myth continues to be used as evidence against institutional racism. If Asians can do well, it says, any minority group can, if they just apply themselves. Her research suggests that the upward mobility of Asian Americans over the past century is actually a result of post-war declines in the labor market discrimination against them, as compared to other minorities. Even as labor market discrimination against Asian Americans has declined, studies show that institutional discrimination never disappeared. Asian job applicants with white and first names received a 7% higher callback rate than those with ethnically Asian first names. Asian renters and home buyers are told about and shown fewer units than whites with the same economic background, and Asian home buyers are offered less financial help. Furthermore, Asian Americans have experienced increase of discrimination from Blacks and whites who are less economically secure. According to Andrea Kambau, economic conditions influence whites' preference and behavior on racial and ethnic matters. In areas where economic conditions are worse, we expect more negative attitudes and actions toward both minorities and immigrants. In places such as Arizona, Asians experience more discrimination on a daily basis than they do in San Francisco. Model minority rhetoric ignores institutional racism against Asian Americans, not to mention fundamental differences in the history and current reality faced by other people of color, such as African Americans and Latinos. Ignoring these backstories enables society to shrink responsibility for the racial inequality that still exists today. In conclusion, racial triangulation has been extremely detrimental to both parties. In the past decade, Black and Asian coalitions have worked together to create a sense of unity and fight against racial discrimination and more. Storefront sought to promote third world unity, primarily between African and Asian American people through a series of Serve the People programs. Activists firmly believed in third world unity, but also realized that while both Blacks and Asian Americans occupied the same space, they also occupied different locations in the racial hierarchy. As a result, Storefront sought to make itself an ally with more groups as an act of solidarity and support. So while some Asians are able to profit off the economic and overall marginalization of Blacks, racial triangulation also alienates Asians. The model minority myth perpetuates harmful stereotypes, pushes the view that Asians are still seen as foreigners, and provides an entirely different narrative that completely disregards all of the struggles that Asian Americans experience. Racial triangulation has been continuously harmful to Blacks as they are again and again pitted at the bottom of the racial order. Racial triangulation has played a key role in determining how different groups see one another. And at the end of the day, how groups see themselves within a Black and white binary society. Well, folks, that's it for today. Have a good day. Okay, so clearly, right, more on this, which is showing, again, model minority, the positionality of Asian Americans as being a little bit inaccurate. And, and once we break down the actual numbers, it doesn't show the true realities, right? That many folks don't have these academic uh, financial success as others, and that there is these other competing factors of discrimination that create these realities, right? So to um, end on, uh, we've covered a lot and, you know, we want to kind of put a bit pin in this for today. So, um, We've learned a little bit more about who Asian Americans are, the enduring um, anti-Asian racism in the United States, uh, what that discrimination and violence looks like in terms of the numbers, what the model minority myth is in terms of invisibilizing Asian American struggles. Uh, we kind of broke that down and then looked at racial triangulation. Again, our key terms for today are whitewashing, typecasting, model minority, and racial triangulation.
I thank you again for tuning in. I know this is a lot of heavy material over the past couple of weeks. We're, you know, at the home stretch. We have one more uh, really awesome lecture after this, and then we'll close for the semester. Thank you for hanging out and, and checking and staying tuned this whole time. So with that, I'll let you all go, and I will see you next time.